Jen Bissell, The Midnight Sky is your sixth movie as production designer for George Clooney. What kind of shorthand do you guys have now? Ah, that's a pretty good one. Um, I think, um, I don't know, when you spend that much time with somebody collaborating creatively, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting because you can get down to some pretty interesting material. Um, it's been a very satisfying six shows. Uh, well, this movie is based on a novel. Did you read the novel? I did, and so did my daughter. And uh, but uh, but George um, took a fairly serious departure from the novel. So the most important thing was to really follow the story that he was telling. What kind of uh, discussions did you have with him early on? Well, it was it was interesting because it's the nature of the drama itself. You know, it's not really an action movie. It's not really uh, it's not it's not a formally structured adventure story. It's um, it's really a meditation, and uh, in that sense, the look is much is much different. You know the um, what he really wanted was to feel like we're in a relatable future, but in the future nonetheless, and and that this is something that actually could happen, which uh, which I think was important in terms of the design of both the uh, the observatory as well as uh, the design of the spaceship. He wanted a unique look to the spaceship, and so you know we tried to sort of veer away from the kind of language that's evolved over the past thirty years you know, that sort of started with. 2001 and continued through Alien and that very industrial look to spaceships and and also the fact that people just ignore the whole problem of gravity you know that uh, you know you take a gravity pill and suddenly you can walk around wherever you are and it, and it's just not the case you know the 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 fact that uh, the fact that the human body reacts so badly to long long term space travel and weightlessness is a real problem and it needs to be solved and and you know of course we're so used to seeing those big circles those big uh, disks spinning from all the way from 2001 to uh to the nautilus design of uh, nasa from 2011 but the big problem is the material that it takes to build those kind of centrifugal uh, uh rings is enormous and so one of the solutions that uh, that we came up with, I think, is what gives the film a really interesting and almost poetic look, and it's very real. It's very relatable, which is to be able to use the current technology of uh, expandable habitats and uh, and use lightweight materials like fabrics to protect the, the crew from radi long term radiation and that sort of thing, but just just basically to have a baton like design that spins around and so it creates centrifugal force, which is, which is the only way you can really imitate gravity and, uh, and keep people's hearts pumping and, you know, and muscles developing. And, uh, and then secure it with this fr outside framework, this exoskeleton, and then have the inside floors of the different uh, compartments of the spaceship uh, have an endoskeleton, which is, and all of these skeletons are lightweight and designed using uh, the topological optimization technology. And that stuff is really organic looking and really interesting looking. It looks a little bit like Gaudi designed it. You know, it's uh, it's really interesting and it it's real and it could work. And it also reinforces the idea that, you know, there are four people traveling through an extremely hazardous environment, you know, whirling around in a bag of gas. And that's what keeps them alive. And it's sort of a metaphor for Earth itself, you know. And it's uh, it's it's sort of interesting how that all developed in terms of the design of the film. Yeah, I I really like that the skeleton structure inside the spaceship because uh, one of the themes of the film is about you know communication and connection with one another, mm -hmm. and they you know look, kind of look like veins or like branches, and they're all connected. So was that also part of your intention behind that? It was. I mean, we faked it. We don't, we don't really know if we were to do an endoskeleton like that, what it would actually look like. It would take a long time to engineer it. Mm -hmm. But we, we had an idea of where the stress points would be. Because one of the other things about that endoskeleton, and one of the things that, uh, that aircraft designers, not spacecraft designers, are trying to cope with is when you have something whirling around like this, 
uh, that's all fine and good, and you can compensate for it. But as people are moving around, as, as you have the mass of the astronauts themselves moving around, that slightly alters the navigation of the sh of the ship. And you know, a little change makes a big difference over 250,000 miles. So you, we're, we're positing that there's sensors all through the endoskeleton, and that that endoskeleton is actually adjustable, and, and it can slightly compensate for the movement of the mass. And that's what keeps uh, this particular system working and keeps the uh, the navigation from uh, screwing up. Uh, well, the movie takes place in 2049, and like you said, it's not really that type of futuristic like space movie. Like it's big in scope, but it's an intimate story. And in the observatory, you know, things don't look that drastically different from they do now. So, how do you go about designing and dressing that set? Well, that that set. We based it on some of the contemporary designs of uh, some of the Antarctic uh, uh, research stations. Uh, specifically, the one that it looks it, it's most closely related to is the, um, I have it written down here. Uh, oh, yes, the Comandante Farrar uh, research station, for, which is Brazil's research station. And, uh, but it's, it basically reflects a modular design with a unistructural uh, interior. And the unistructure, once again, very much like the topological optimization that we used in the spacecraft, reflects sort of the interior uh, of, uh, of Augustine's mind. You know, it's, it's, it's gotta be cold. It's gotta, it's gotta show the vast spaces and the sort of the lack of emotional warmth that he gains through the insight of his journey from the, from the uh, observatory to the new weather station where the larger antenna is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, once again, we're using sort of contemporary architectural motifs like this unistructural joist system that you will see in the interior of the, uh, the, interior of the Bar uh, Barbo Observatory and, uh, and use it also to reflect you know, the character's uh, interior. His, uh, his situation. Uh, and the movie is almost like two films because you have Augustine's story in the Arctic and then you have the astronauts in space trying to come back. And I know it was filmed in two ships, uh, first in Iceland and then in London for the space stuff. So what was the prep like? Well, the prep was amazing. I mean, I love Iceland. <laughs> God, <it's so> <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the way that the light uh, plays in the environments in Iceland is just extraordinary and inspirational. And in a way reflected, uh, you know, in some of the work that we did on the interior of the spaceship. Uh, the big thing about the interior of the spaceship was uh, to have defined spaces where people could do things together, where people could stay fit, where they could eat and have a social life, but also where they could be alone in case they really started getting tired of the company they were keeping. You know, you spent two and a half years with four people and there's bound to be a little bit of friction on occasion. So everybody has their own little isolation pods and, and it's a, you know, it's this bag of gas twirling through space, coming back to earth. And um, I'm sorry, I wandered away there just for a moment, but the, uh, but the, uh, but the prep was interesting in that we also were prepping um, on another volcanic island, which was uh, La Palma down in the Canary Islands for the work at the exterior of earlier observatories that Augustine had worked with, as well as the planet that they eventually wind up going back to. And um, uh, I think I did a lot of bouncing around, but mostly it was nice to have Shepperton Studios, which is where we built all the sets in the middle between Iceland and <laughs> uh, Canary Islands, because both of them were about a two and a half, three hour plane right away. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, scout a glacier in Iceland? Um, dressed very warmly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's actually very convenient. I think when I first read the script and knew that we had this kind of uh, situation where we weren't quite sure when we were going to shoot it, but we felt it probably would be in October, September, October, somewhere in there. and. And yet we wanted it to look very, uh, very cold, very, uh, very harsh. And uh, and the best way to, to ensure that is to shoot on a glacier. You don't really know what, especially now with global warming, you don't you don't know what kind of weather you're going to get 
I don't care if you're in a, on a glacier in British Columbia or if you're in Iceland, it's really unpredictable. So, you know, the larger glaciers uh, are probably the best place to shoot those kind of snow scenes. And, uh, and so uh, most of the stuff in British Columbia, you have to helicopter into. And, uh, and in Iceland, they're actually pretty, uh, pretty accessible. It's about an, uh, about an hour, hour's drive up from the coast, where, which is where a lot of the accommodation was. You fly into Reykjavik can take three hours to get down there near the glacier. And then every day you have about an hour commute up and an hour commute back uh, to get up to it. it. But it's pretty convenient, all things considered. And you only have like a couple hours to shoot too, right? Well, yeah, you're starting, you're starting to lose light, but it wasn't that bad because it, you know it's right after the uh, equinox, which was in September 21st, and we were shooting late October into early November, and uh, so it wasn't that bad. But of course, there's always the weather too, which is you just don't know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. so it got pretty windy up there. Yeah. Well, I mean, you obviously you shot this before COVID, but what do you make of how timely the movie's themes of isolation and connection are now? It's extraordinary. And, and it was, uh, you know, it was really sort of depressing. I spent nine months working on a movie about the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it really gets to you after a while when you're thinking about it all the time, especially, you know, when I look at it from a designer's point of view, how do you sort of be nonspecific but still show that the world is at an end? And I so we better find out, like, what that event was. Just so well, it, it out. the event, but, it, you know, it's probably a dog pile. It, you know, I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, you got to, it's like, Augustine's got all this data and he finally realizes what's really happening. The event is whatever the cataclysm is that happens after probably global warming caused mass migrations, mass migrations caused pandemics, pandemics caused political instability, po political instability caused access, you know, of nefarious groups to nuclear weapons and who knows what blew the whole world up. But it, you know, it's a, it's a dog pile of just not paying attention. You know, and and I think that's what we were trying to convey that, you know, in his own way, the only thing that Augustine paid attention to was space. And it was the, his journey, it's his journey with the little girl across the Arctic wasteland that sort of makes him focus on what his life really is all about and what's important. Awesome. Well, Jim, congratulations on everything. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank Very you. nice talking with you, Joyce.